some of you. Good afternoon to others of you. Welcome to all of you. My name is Abiola Adiemi. I'm an International Program Specialist here at USDFS based in Washington, D.C. I'm the Global Program Team Lead in our Development Assistance Branch, and welcome to all of you. I, I know that we're, we're dealing with different time zones, people in Europe, people in Africa, and people all over the country. And so I really appreciate you all taking the time out to join us today. And we're all here for a very, um, what I think will be a very interesting presentation um, on our research project that was basically two years in the making. In the past year and a half, we've, we've undertaken this, uh, what I believe is a very important uh, project on our Montgomery Dole School Feeding Program which is now in its 20th year in 2022. Um, basically, we are looking at, even though we all have different missions, different goals, um, the, the end for all of us is the same, looking towards the nurturing and fostering future generations through some of the basic tenets of, of basic food needs and nutrition requirements from, from birth all the way through adolescence. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our friends and colleagues at Mississippi State, who are our research partners in this endeavor, so they can share with us and brief us on your findings. And we look forward to a robust conversation, discussion, a Q&A session towards the end. And at around the almost a two hour mark, we'll be presented uh, with some closing remarks from USC's Associate Administrator, Brooke Jameson. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Gina Rico Mendez, the team lead from Mississippi State. And with that, over to you, Gina. Thank you, Abiola, and good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce you my colleagues, uh, Dr. Teresa Tolor Peterson. She is an associate professor from the Department of Food Science, Nutrition, and Health Promotion at Mississippi State University. She will be leading our discussion uh, about the nutrition components of a school meals uh, and their effects on nutritional outcomes. And Dr. Daniel Petrolia, he is a professor from the Department of Agricultural Economics at Mississippi State University, and he will be leading the discussion uh, around procurement in uh, school feeding programs. My name is Gina Rico Mendez again, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm an assistant research professor at uh, the Social Science Research Center with Mississippi State University. Uh, with that, I'm going to kick us in our presentation. All right. So our presentation today is going to be split uh, into three uh, broad parts um, or four. An overview of the McGovernDoll Food for Education program and then specifically we're going to be presenting the results of our uh, Mississippi State University research effort around three issues, uh, nutritional composition of school meals and learning outcomes, procurement and partnerships. As Abiola mentioned, there is going to be some closing remarks from uh, USDA administ FAS administrator and would like to hear from uh, your feedback. Okay, third. Uh, we have at the time, as we started, like uh, over 50 people in the call. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I wanted to start this presentation by highlighting the importance of school feeding programs boldly, broadly, but in low income and food insecure places especially. Research has shown that implementation uh, of a school meal programs can lead to improvements in nutrition of preschool and school age children, and in cases of pregnant nursing women uh, when targeted by these interventions. Along with that, school feeding programs contribute to improving learning outcomes of students, and therefore they can yield high return on investment of development interventions in nutrition. Other benefits of a school feeding that you can see in the bottom of uh, my uh, this slide uh, include the promotion of gender equality by creating conditions to encourage female female attendance to school 
or reducing the barriers to dropouts. Also, community engagement and well-being by promoting a food systems approach to school feeding or something that uh, it's well known as the homegrown school feeding approach to this issue. And very importantly, school feeding programs are a critical social safety, safety net and social support measure tool. Uh, given the importance of a school feeding programs and the role of McGovern Dole program in this area, the USDA FAS and USAID Africa Bureau partner to address three broad research questions from the McGovern Dole learning agenda. And this is how Mississippi State uh, was selected to conduct research and learning on the McGovern Dole pro program implementation in six countries of interest around three questions, partnerships, a comparative analysis of procurement models, and the effects of nutrition components and educational outcomes. Uh, in a collaborative effort, uh, the three groups, Mississippi State, USAID, Africa Bureau, and USDA FAS, agreed that for learning purposes, not all the questions would have been addressed in all the uh, programs, uh, six programs of interest, but instead we strategically selected a set of McGovern all countries to focus on uh, certain ones per research question. So that way, the partnerships uh, question, what we call question one, uh, focus on the analysis of the implementations in Kenya, Rwanda, uh, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. What we call question two or procurement analysis focuses on the implementation of the World Food Program in Kenya and Rwanda and the implementation of the lead by the Catholic Relief Services in Burkina Faso. And the third, um, the question about nutritional components and the effects on educational outcomes uh, focus on the efforts uh, led by Counterpart International in Senegal and global communities in Tanzania. It is worth mentioning that the findings of this research mostly relied on performance data provided by the FAS and implementing partners uh, that it was provided to us. Uh, and so thanks the implementing partners for their support in this research effort. In addition, we conducted semi-structured uh, interviews with staff from the implementers of McGovern Dole that uh, complement our research effort, but not formal data collection for the research questions on procurement and nutrition took place under this uh, research effort. We also use, uh, especially for question number uh, three, uh, secondary socioeconomic data and policy documents that allowed us allowed us to conduct a policy analysis of school feeding programs. Um, now I'm going to uh, pass it uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the McGovern Dole program, which is uh, in its 20th year uh, this year. Uh, the McGovern Dole International Fruit for Educational Child Nutrition Program that we call this like MGD helps support education, child development and food security in low income and food de deficit countries around the globe. The program provides for donation of U.S. Com agricultural commodities as well as financial and technical assistance to support school feeding and maternal and child nutrition projects. The McGovern Dole program uh, dates back to early 2000s with the launch of the Global Food for Education Initiative or GFEI pilot, the, which is, was announced by President Clinton at the G8 summit in Japan uh, with a focus on the provision of uh, school meals. Um, some of the lessons provided by that pilot were later incorporated in the design of the McGovern Dole program, which was authorized for the first time in the 2002 Farm Bill, and then uh, also gave the USDA FAS the uh, uh, role as a coordinating entity. In 2008, uh, the local and regional procurement program pilot program started or was conceived uh, and uh, between 2009 and 2012, 21 local and regional procurement pilot projects were funded in 19 countries. Uh, lessons from that were um, uh, put into an evaluation uh, report in 2012. In 2011, uh, the around the McGovern Dole program, there was also uh, another uh, project called the Micronutrient 45 Foot 8 Products Pilot 
that uh, some of the results from that uh, later were incorporated also into the MAC uh program. And in the early 2010s, there was an important switch in the program towards a results-oriented management approach. And it was important because it switched from measuring outputs to measuring outcomes. And therefore, uh, they started uh, considering the importance of having a baseline, midterm, and inline evaluations to to assess the progress of their efforts. In 2014, uh, LRP standalone projects were authorized, and in 2018, um, they were in they were uh, approved. And more recently, in 2018, uh, this shift from standalone projects to local and regional procurement-like activities and their McGovernor programs took place. As I mentioned in this last slide, uh, in the early 2010s, my governed all shifted towards a results oriented management approach uh, that resulted in the development of the two results framework or strategic objectives, what we call SO1 and SO2, as well as uh, the beginning of three year awards and uh, the requirement for semi annual performance reports and evaluations. So, this is the strategic. Uh, Objective um, one, which direct the McGovernor programmatic and project level efforts. Uh, these strategic objectives seek to improve literacy of school age children through intermediate objectives like the improvement of quality of literacy, education, attentiveness, and attendance. And to achieve these, the increased access to food through school meal provision is fundamental. Along with that uh, strategic objective uh, one, a strategic objective two seeks to increase the use of health, nutrition, and dietary practices. And both results framework are supported by what is called the foundational results, which are in green in the bottom, uh, which it is uh, building the program designed to ensure local gains, capacity building, and long-term efforts that is expected to ensure the sustainability of school feeding efforts. Uh, each of the McGovern Dole project implementations in the six countries of interest have uh, adapted the McGovern Dole programmatic guidance that I just show in their uh, two results framework, and they adapted it to the uh, local needs. So each program has a different timeline, and given the expertise of each implementing partner, there have been some uh, focus maybe on, on some activities con compared to others, but they all share that uh, common uh, idea of using the, the programmatic scheme uh, design or building the strategic uh, objectives. Um, they uh, all have received U.S. in-kind commodities, and while the uh, local and regional procurement program has strategically selected commodities that can be produced locally and would later contribute to school meal provision, uh, component of the program. So this table shows uh, some of the program outcomes in terms of direct beneficiaries, which includes children, but also like other beneficiaries, like maybe farmers, uh, maybe parents, teachers, uh, the number of schools benefiting from the program, uh, the school age uh, children benefiting from the program, what we call the local and regional procurement beneficiaries, and uh, just a summary of what in-kind commodities they receive in the uh, LRP commodities that they have received. Just uh, as a note, uh, here we are uh, in the case of Sierra Leone, by the time we conducted our analysis, uh, they have not yet received an LRP component, but we know that at the time uh, they are working on the uh, introduction of LRP component within their uh, effort. Here is just like a summary of uh, each um, implementation and just highlight of some of the activities that the McGovern Dole projects do in country. So for instance, this is the Burkina Faso 
uh, highlight led by the Catholic Relief Services, and then are some specific activities on the literacy, uh, attentiveness and attendance component, and the health and dietary practices that include, of course, the provision of school meals, the distribution of school supplies and materials, literacy and reading activities, and then on the other hand, training on nutrition, health and hygiene practices, raising awareness on health, nutrition and wash, uh, distribution of micronutrient and warmer medication, Establish health clubs, and these are just examples of uh, their activities. Uh, the Kenya program is of the six programs we studied, the largest, um, the oldest, I'm sorry, of the programs uh, we studied. And the first award was uh, given to the World Food Program in 2004. And here's like some of the critical activities that they have developed. Interestingly, here we're reporting the efforts from my governed all, <clears throat> but uh, once the project transfer in this last stage to the um, national government, it was a very important expansion of the number of uh, school aid children benefiting from the program. Rwanda, also uh, led by the, the World Food Program, has very uh, important activities in literacy, attentiveness, and attendance, uh, and also very important efforts on homegrown school feeding with a very uh, um, significant efforts on building local capacity uh, and a close relationship with the, with the governments that will uh, expectantly improve the sustainability of the efforts. In Senegal, uh, the, um, uh, there is also very important efforts at the local level that would support the transition, the work with school committees, government officials, steering committees. committees. Uh, there are so important efforts in addition to the literacy and health and dietary practices activities that we contribute to, to the transition. Uh, Sierra Leone, here, uh, some important efforts right now on the development of the local and regional food um, component uh, that is um, going to contribute to develop that local capacity in the agricultural production aspect. And finally, in the case of Tanzania, important efforts at the local level as well to support the uh, provision and the efforts uh, um, of a school feeding, but also a close work with the communities that we observe in this effort. So with this uh, introduction, I'm going to pass it to Dr. Toller Peterson. She is going to tell us about the nutritional components of school meals uh, used in the cases of Senegal and Tanzania. Very easy to you. Thanks. Thank you, Gina. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to work on this uh, very important project. Um, my uh, area was the component three, effect of nutrition components of school meals on educational outcomes. And I worked with uh, four students and I'm very happy to say that all four students successfully uh, graduated. Uh, Nicole Reeder uh, graduated with her doctor degree in nutrition. Marina Roberts uh, graduated uh, from uh, with her master in food science, nutrition and health promotion, concentration health promotion. Abby Reynolds uh, graduated with master uh, concentration nutrition and Caitlin Wall uh, with uh, undergraduate degree in um, food science, nutrition and health promotion, all from uh, Mississippi State University. We divide our research question on three steps. Um, and I in 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 this PowerPoint, I in this presentation, I call it phases. So phase one was compile existing data and resources. Phase two, evaluate provided data. Uh, and in this case, it was uh, uh, those uh, meals provided for children in two countries. And um, 
and it be evaluated uh, on nutrition value, dietary diversity, frequency, and adequacy of nutrient content. And then the last part, phase three, was to look at the, the impact of those meals and of nutrition on uh, educational outcomes. So the first phase was to compile all existing data and resources. Uh, we uh, decide to uh, do it in form of systematic reviews. So we look at all the research already done and published in, in, in those areas uh, and, um, and, and try to compile that research and learn from it. So we identify three areas where we want to learn more what already uh, was published. Right. So, the, so the first area was uh, which nutrients are associated with stunting among children ages two and older, which nutrients are important for cognitive development, again, in the same age children, and what is the relative impact of school meals interventions in preschools on educational outcomes? So first things uh, I want to mention is that uh, why uh, this uh, phase one was so important and kind of unique is that we focus on uh, the age of children which is underrepresented in, in research. Um, we have a lot of data on the first thousand days um, of, of, of children. Uh, we, of course, know that those uh, days, the, 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 you know, that time of the child uh, development is extremely important regarding stunting, cognitive development, um, you know, development in general. Uh, but there's really uh, missing information on children past those thousand days and before they start school. And that's not only in uh, low income countries, but it's also true for high income countries. So I think that's why uh, our uh, research was very, very important. So the first uh, area was what nutrients are associated with stunting or important in, in you know, uh, in stunted children. So we follow in all our systematic reviews, we follow uh, PRISMA guidelines, which is a set of guidelines uh, which needs to be followed uh, in, in, in review articles. We focus on children two to six years. I have to um, admit that, uh, you know, some of the studies included children younger than uh, six, uh, younger than two years. Some studies maybe included children's, uh, children over six years. Uh, but if they include children in this age, two to six years, we uh, included those studies. We focus uh, on sub-Saharan Africa, so only studies performed in sub-Saharan Africa were included, and all the studies published in the past 10 years. Um, the research questions was which nutrients are associated with stunting or which are important uh, in, in stunting. And uh, the research, uh, the main researcher was Abi Reynolds, uh, this research was part of her uh, thesis research, and the uh, um, article was submitted for publications under the title Nutrients Associated with Stunting Among Children in Sub-Saharan Africa, a Systematic Review. We submit uh, this research to maternal and child nutrition. Uh, we are still waiting uh, for um, if this uh, article, you know, for, for, for feedback from um, uh, reviewers. And this is the main findings of our research. So children with stunting tend to consume a diet lower in nutrients commonly found in high quality protein foods. So that will be essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, 
vitamin B12 and choline. And uh, some of the examples of high quality protein foods will be any uh, animal based food like seafood, meat, uh, dairy, eggs, but also beans and, and soy. Uh, the second uh, reviews, the sef second question was what nutrients are important for cognitive development? I have to say that uh, we really struggle to find any uh, good research in that area. Uh, we also follow the PRISMA guidelines. Uh, again, we include only children, uh, you know, two to six years, if they include studies, if they include uh, this uh, age range. And uh, because there was very little of research, uh, we uh, had to open our search for 20 years. So uh, anything published uh, from the year 2000 to 2021, um, we included in our systematic review. And also uh, because there were not enough studies uh, in, in, in Africa, we uh, opened this search to, to any studies uh, anywhere in the, in the world. The lead researcher uh, was Marina Roberts. This article, uh, this research got already published and it was selected uh, as a cover publication under the name of the effect of nutrition interventions on cognitive development of preschool age children, a systematic review. Uh, this is, uh, it was published in Nutrients with pretty good uh, impact factor. Uh, it, a, it is an open access journal, so uh, if you are interested, you can find it uh, under this title uh, on, on PubMed. And um, the findings uh, of this research was um, that iron and multiple micronutrient supplementation yield improvement in cognitive abilities of undernourished preschool age children. So only undernourished children benefited from iron and, and multiple micronutrient supplementation, iron or multiple micronutrient supplementation. Uh, for nourished children, because remember, we include studies uh, conducted anywhere in, around the world, so also in uh, high income countries. Uh, increased fish consumption was found to have beneficial effect in the cognitive outcomes of nourished children. Uh, so this research uh, reviewed 12 uh, trials and uh, eight of those trials found significant uh, effect uh, of one of this uh, component on cognitive outcomes. The third research was uh, what is the relative impact of school meal interventions in preschools on educational outcomes. So again, the same methodology, we follow the PRISMA guidelines. Uh, we included the same age children, preschool and primary school children. Uh, so again, the age two to six years uh, was included. Uh, research done in Sub-Saharan Africa. Here are the list of the countries which uh, uh, have some kind of uh, research study which we included in this systematic review. And uh, we include any studies published in the past 10 years. The lead author was Caitlin Wall uh, and, and, and I. And um, this article is already published uh, under the name The Impact of School Meal Programs on Educational Outcomes in Africa, African School Children Systematic Review. It got published in uh, Environmental Research uh, and Public Health. Uh, it is, again, it is an open access journal with a pretty good impact factor. Uh, this is the abstract, uh, and you can um, you can find this article if you are interested uh, again under the title uh, in PubMed. The main findings of of uh, this research was that um, school meals 
uh, increased enrollment, one of those, you know, every study focus on something different. Some maybe follow the enrollment, some had uh, test scores. Uh, so every uh, research focus on something different. Uh, but those main findings were that uh, school meals increase enrollment, increase attendance, decrease in dropout rate, improve test scores, increase competency scores, and include, increase uh, cognitive uh, performance. Um, so there was positive correlation between school meals, uh, feeding programs, and educational outcomes. There was some discussion about uh, that meal times reduce classroom time, but uh, the authors, um, you know, concluded that uh, the the benefit outweighed uh, the potential loss of the of the learning uh, time. And the recommendation was that school meals. Uh, uh, programs uh, should be Im implemented and expanded and if possible should uh, start uh, from a young age uh, of those children. So the summary of phase one regarding stunting, there are some uh, very important nutrients even for those children which are uh, older like essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, vitamin B12, and choline. Uh, there are some nutrients which are important for cognitive development, like iron, multiple micronutrient supplement, and uh, fish. And school meals has the potential to increase enrollment, increase attendance, decrease in dropout rate, improve test scores, increase competency scores and increase cognitive performance. So then uh, in phase two, we evaluate the existing uh, lunch meals provided uh, to children in, in two countries. And um, in the proposal, uh, before we got the data, we uh, suggested that we're going to evaluate uh, the nutrition value of school meals, dietary diversity, frequency, and nutrition adequacy. Uh, the, the countries of interest were uh, Tanzania and Senegal. You see that uh, those are two quite different countries uh, with a little bit different uh, approach to school meals. And I don't gonna talk about the uh, approach to the school meals, uh, I just, going to talk about evaluating the nutrition value of those meals. So regarding Senegal, uh, we, uh, we evaluate school meals, and this is the average of the eight meals uh, provided uh, in elementary school. So carbohydrate, the composition uh, of the calories, about 70% came from uh, carbohydrates, about 12% from protein, and about 23% from fat. We also, uh, this is an example of one of the meal. Uh, we evaluate all the meals uh, on uh, their macro and micronutrients um, intake. So, um, or content, so vitamins, minerals, uh, and of course the carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Here is example uh, of the preschool meals, which we evaluate uh, the same way. And we also compare the, uh, the primary school meals composition to WHO standards for, um, for meals. So, um, you know, here we evaluate all eight meals uh, and, and look at um, um, how it's compared to the recommendation uh, to target uh, for nutrient content per school meal. So carbohydrates, you see that um, all the meals exceeded the 100%. In protein, it was around 100%. Uh, and uh, in fat, it was, uh, a lot, uh, you know, around 80%. We also um, evaluate the nutrition meals for adequacy um, for um, uh, the mi micronutrient content. 
So uh, you see uh, here uh, all those mi micronutrients which we uh, look at. This is a comparison to the RDA, percentage of RDA. And uh, in regarding Senegal, we really didn't have um, data to uh, look at the dietary diversity. Uh, so we only could evaluate the meal for dietary di diversity, but that does not necessarily mean, mean that that's the dietary diversity of, of the child because we don't know what the child eats uh, maybe uh, at home or um, or you know any anywhere else. So um, the meals provided um, uh, food from two groups uh, for the preschool children and for the uh, primary school children uh, because uh, the community contributed uh, with some uh, items. It's, it's provided about uh, uh, food from four uh, groups. So in summary, uh, we evaluate nutrition value of those meals. Uh, regarding nutrition adequacy, meals provided more than 100% of carbohydrate and protein and only about 80% of fat. Then uh, in Tanzania, uh, we evaluate again um, all the meals for the macronutrient and micronutrient uh, content. Uh, here you see that um, uh, uh, regarding calories, about 79% of calories came from uh, carbohydrates, about 10% from protein and 10% from fat. So it's a little bit different than uh, in Senegal. And um, again, uh, here is uh, comparing to WHO standards for carbohydrate, protein and fat. And um, if you look at it, so 100% um, uh, of the carbohydrates, or 73% of protein, and only 42% of fat recommendation. Uh, we did have some data for dietary diversity, uh, which we try to um, evaluate. Um, and, and we also had data for the uh, uh, control and intervention group. So here you see the overall uh, dietary diversity of those children and uh, then comparing the control school with the intervention schools. There really was, was not much difference. Uh, this is at baseline. And um, this is Again, uh, at baseline looking, uh, it is recommended to have um, at least uh, four, um, uh, four groups uh, in the diet. So you see that, uh, uh, you know, there, there still was uh, quite a few children who didn't reach this uh, cut of four. And um, again, comparing uh, intervention schools uh, and control groups. Uh, this is again in uh, in baseline. So there was not much difference. If any, not significant difference was uh, that uh, the, the control group seemed to have a little bit better diet. Uh, definitely more, uh, they, they consume more dairy. And uh, most of the calories uh, came, of course, from, from grain, but quite a few uh, children have uh, flesh uh, food as well. So um, in conclusion, uh, school meals given to, to children in Tanzania and Senegal provided adequate calories, protein, and, and carbohydrates uh, uh, especially uh, for Senegal, for, but uh, in Tanzania, there was uh, definitely very low on uh, on the on the calories from um, from from fat. So meals are lacking certain nutrient importance for support to support cognitive development, such as essential fatty acids, 
vitamin C, calcium, and iron, and vitamin B12, especially if the co those commodities were not uh, fortified. So the last uh, part is phase three, so to look at the impact of those meals on educational outcomes in those two countries. So the phase one was to compile the existing information. Phase two was to evaluate the existing meals. Uh, and phase three is to look at how those, uh, the impact of those meals on educational outcomes. Regarding Senegal, um, educational outcomes uh, to follow were attendance, enrollment, and achievement. So regarding attendance, attendance increased uh, in, um, uh, in 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 uh, was increased. The length of stay at school also increased in the intervention group. Uh, enrollment increased. Achievement. Uh, the literacy level increased across all grade levels. In Tanzania, again, uh, we look at the attendance, enrollment, and achievements. Uh, so the attendance was uh, improved by 6.5%, and also there was decrease in absenteeism by 3.1%. Enrollment increased, but it was not statistically significant. And regarding achievement, the results were uh, not consistent. Uh, it seems like in second grade, uh, the achievement increased, but in fourth grade, there was uh, no difference. We also came up with uh, some recommendations for improving school meals in Africa, uh, if possible. So uh, increased intake of high protein foods uh, like fish, meat, dairy, poultry, and eggs will be beneficial to provide some of the target nutrients, uh, which are iron, vitamin B12, and then essential fatty acids. Also, uh, there could be some uh, modifications in um, uh, you know, how to make those uh, meals provided, maybe enhance the, the absorption of those nutrients. So, for example, um, iron absorption will be increased by providing uh, vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C really was slow in all of those meals. Uh, that, you know, usually we don't worry so much about vitamin C content, but if the if the diet is really poor, it, it will be one, one of the vitamins of concern, uh, for example, because it's optimized the absorption of iron. Also, um, beans are very important nutrient, uh, very rich in nutrients, but uh, sometimes uh, the absorption of those nutrients could be affected uh, by the phytic acid content of the beans. So. Uh, maybe the preparation, uh, I'm not sure how it was prepared, but maybe soaking uh, of, of beans uh, the night before will help uh, uh, with uh, make, make those nutrients more available, bioavailable for the body. And of course, you know, Im improve the diversity of the meals if possible. So key nutrients of concerns. Uh, are essential fatty acids, uh, DHA and e -A EPA, uh, which are uh, usually in animal-based uh, food, uh, but also uh, in some, um, you know, like nuts and seeds. So that's that's some uh, something uh, to keep in mind that uh, it's very important for uh, for brain development and and also for for growth. We also came up uh, with some recommendations for future research. Um, this, this topic of how diet uh, and school meals um, can help in education outcomes, I think it's, it's extremely important. And um, 
there's really lack of uh, information and research in that area. So we thought that um, maybe collecting 24 hour di dietary recalls on sample population from intervention and control group uh, will, will, will be really beneficial. Uh, those 24 hour recalls can be uh, me, maybe obtained every three months for a on, on a sample population, maybe five percent of children from ran, you know randomly selected from from each of the school. And uh, on those children which will be included in the study, uh, all the other information will need to be collected, like demographic data, enrollment, attendance, test scores. Uh, this will really um, help um, to see the connection between the diet and the educational outcomes. Uh, we will also be able to see what children eat at school and what they eat at home. And also not only what um, they should eat or what is, should be served, but, but what is really consumed. Uh, and, and if the child eats everything what is on the plate uh, or maybe not everything. So th I think that's that's will be very important. And. Um, and also, uh, you know, part of the 24 hour recall is uh, to record portion size and how the food was uh, prepared and served. So uh, that will give us a little bit more information about, about the diet uh, of those children. OK, that's all what I have. Um, I don't know if we have time for a discussion now or if uh, we're going to have discussion at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Teresa, for your presentation. Yes, we're going to have discussion at the at the end of the uh, presentation and there are some questions already on the chat, so we're going to use this uh, at the end. So I'm going to pass it to uh, Dr. Daniel Petrolia. Uh, he is going to talk us about a different dimension of the school meals and it's the the procurement models. So Dan to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me get my. Screen up here. Uh, can everybody see my? Uh, hold on just a second. Or, all right, can everybody see my title screen and can hear me all right? Yes. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you all for uh, tuning in today and, and good morning. Um, I want to say thank you to Abiola and to Gina for getting uh, this together and for everyone that's that's on right now. Uh, so as, as Gina mentioned, my part of the uh, talk will focus on the procurement component of this project. Uh, this was led primarily by faculty and students in the Department of Agricultural Economics at Mississippi State. So that included uh, me and then also uh, Will Davis, a faculty member, and then two of our graduate students, Mpatsu Chinsinga, who joined our master's program from Malawi, and Barbara Okai, who joined our master's program from Ghana. Um, even though uh, they weren't part of this particular component. Uh, I can't thank Gina and Sierra Nelson enough for their support uh, on this component. All right, so just to give a quick overview, so we're focused here on procurement, so we're particularly interested in the LRP program. Uh, so, and in particular, when the LRP program was a separate component, um, which is a little different from from what's taking place now, where it's where it's embedded in the regular. Uh, McGovern Dole uh, uh, programs. So we're focused on uh, this program that ran from FY 2016 to 19, uh, including several countries from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, there were five PVOs involved in these programs, World Food Program, Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, uh, Project Concern International, and Counterpart International. Uh, over this span, uh, the program involved uh, nearly $35 million in award value uh, with an estimated 296,000 beneficiaries. So for our analysis here, we did a case study on three of these countries, um, Burkina Faso, Kenya, and Rwanda. 
Uh, so we're using these three countries to help us understand the structure, the role, and the outcome of these USDA funded LRP programs. Just to give some context about when these LRP programs uh, were funded in the context of the other MGD awards. So for example, Rwanda's LRP program was in FY16. So right in the middle of uh, three of the MGD programs that had been uh, awarded to Rwanda. Kenya's came toward the end of their series of MGD awards. So that happened in FY17. And then Burkina Faso's LRP award came in FY19. So uh, again, towards the middle, a little bit slightly towards the end uh, relative to the other MGD awards. Um, all right, so our goal here is to evaluate the structure and effects of these programs, and hopefully that can allow us to measure the program's impacts and effectiveness. Uh, we do this primarily by looking at two sources of information. Uh, first is the uh, baseline and endline evaluation reports, and then the other is uh, LRP indicator data. Uh, our goal here is to identify the limitations of the existing data and then um, and then hopefully recommend some changes that could improve uh, future work. So let's start with the analysis of the LRP evaluation reports. Um, so we focused on the baseline, the endline reports for these three countries that I mentioned. And uh, what these reports provide is information on the structure, the goals, and the outcomes of LRP. Uh, now, one goal shared across these three programs um, is improving the cost effectiveness and the timeliness of the school food provision. Uh, with the idea being here that supplementing the international commodities with local foods can provide meals at a lower cost with fewer delays. Now, this requires that local ag systems are capable of satisfying the program needs. And the baseline report suggests that that local ag systems, in fact, have sufficient capacity to do so. <clears throat> now, I'll mention that data limitations uh, prevented us from really digging into cost effectiveness. So here we focus on the issue of timeliness. Um, the report shows some notable limitations uh, to timely deliveries, which had an impact on quality of the commodities. Uh, generally, uh, these issues were caused by uh, slow internal quality control and insufficient storage and transportation. In particular in Burkina Faso, most of the deliveries to the canteens were late and a significant amount of commodity stocks were lost. Generally, this was due to prolonged storage, uh, often in inadequate facilities. And as a result, the, the delivered commodities were of uh, lower quality than expected. Um, now, improvements to these processes would, would likely lead to more timely delivery and higher quality uh, commodities. <clears throat> the next, uh, next key point I'll turn to is the supply chain. So another set of issues identified was that transporters were often found to lack sufficient knowledge of the challenges of delivering to remote locations. And in some cases, they simply didn't even have the, the means to make the deliveries. For example, there may have been vehicles that were lacking to make those deliveries. Um, and then weather played a role as well. So especially in Kenya, some unanticipated weather events led to some schools receiving uh, a lower amount of commodities than was uh, initially intended. The next component I'll turn to is uh, smallholder farmers. So a goal of all three of the country programs was improving the capabilities of smallholder farmers. Uh, we find evidence to suggest that the program did in fact benefit uh, smallholder farmers uh, via training and knowledge. 
Uh, now, there was some evidence that some of the trainings were seen as a bit uh, difficult uh, for some of the trainees that had lower levels of education. <clears throat> in Kenya, in particular, uh, smallholder farmers that participated in farmer organizations um, that they found useful, they also saw significant improvements in commodity sorting and cleaning. Um, and also, because of this uh, participation in the FOs, we saw an increase in the share of uh, member produced commodities being marketed. In Rwanda, we also saw evidence of success. Uh, so we saw that the capacity of the cooperatives uh, to sustain themselves increased uh, in spite of the fact that some remained fragile, but nevertheless, they were, there was an improvement from that baseline. Um, cooperatives tended to have clearer business structures at end line. Um, many buyers stated that the cooperatives mentalities had changed and that the cooperatives were able to provide a greater share of their commodities. And then finally, we saw that a lower number of orders were rejected based on quality. So we saw some quality improvements. <clears throat> so in general, we, what we see is that the smallholder farmers and the co-ops gained increased access to buyers, specifically because of the LR LRP program efforts. So to conclude uh, the main findings of the analysis of the evaluation reports, uh, what we find is that local ag systems appear to have the capacity to meet the program needs in spite of some challenges. And those challenges being primarily due to transportation issues, uh, quality control, uh, again, due to storage and delivery, and then also weather. Um, identifying and addressing these limitations it seems to be key to ensuring program effectiveness. Um, again, in general, we find that the LRP program provided significant benefits to the local ag systems. So we saw increased capacity and increased capabilities primarily through training, uh, through increases in direct purposes and improvements in contracts, and then facilitation of better business practices. The LRP improved the capacity and the performance of smallholder farmer cooperatives, uh, including their organizational practices and quality and quantity control. Uh, the LRP program improved relationships between buyers and sellers. So now I'll switch over to the indicator of the, uh, excuse me, the analysis of the LRP indicator data. So to give some background about these indicators, so there are, so the LRP program has 16 standard indicators. 13 of these indicators are classified as output indicators. So these are indicators one through six, nine through 11, and 13 through 16. Um, if you're not familiar with with these indicators, um, in just a, a moment here, we'll, we'll see what what each of them is measuring. Uh, but in general, these 13 output indicators are measuring products, goods and services resulting from program activities. These output indicators all have zero baselines. So that means that we're not measuring it against uh, what was going on prior to the program, so they're all starting from zero. On the other hand, there are three indicators that are outcome indicators. These are indicators 7, 8, and 12. These are measuring intermediate effects of the program. These are the ones that have non-zero baselines, and those baselines are the prior year levels. Now, some limitations that we faced um, well, not limitations so much, but just facts of the particular uh, countries that we studied, is that not all countries use all of the indicators. So, for example, Kenya did not use or measure indicator number nine. Burkina Faso did not use number 10. None of the three countries that we used, uh, or excuse me, that we studied 
used indicator 12 and 13. And then Kenya and Rwanda did not use indicator 16. Now, in addition to these standard indicators, uh, the countries can have their own custom indicators. So these are metrics particular to the country and particular to the program. Now, these can be very useful on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, it does mean limitations in terms of comparison across other countries and other programs. So uh, for our particular countries, Burkina Faso actually had 17 custom indicators and Rwanda had four custom indicators. Now, one limitation was that um, the indicator data, indicator data that we were provided, there was no baseline values for R Rwanda, either for the standard or the custom indicators. So there are going to be several graphs here, so uh, bear with me. But what we're going to do here for our first step is to walk through a comparison of the program targets versus their actual by fiscal year. After we get through this, we'll then look at the project life to see how things are different when you compare fiscal year performance to uh, project life performance. But if we start with the top left uh, uh, figure here, this is for LRP indicator number one. So this is measuring the number of individuals participating in the LRP program. Now what we see here is that the number of individuals participating generally exceeded the target. So the target measures are in the green bars and the actual is in the orange bar. So our understanding is that this is particularly measuring the students participating in the program. Um, if we turn to the top right, which is indicator number two, here we're measuring the number of individuals benefiting indirectly our understanding is that this is measuring individuals other than the students. And what we see here again is that the, the, uh, the actual generally exceeds the targets. As we turn to the bottom left for indicator number three, we're measuring the number of social assistance beneficiaries uh, participating in productive safety nets. Um, Again, what we're seeing here is that the beneficiary levels are generally at their targets for Burkina Faso and Rwanda and exceeding targets in Kenya. Uh, these are generally the poor households and children who received uh, in-kind transfers to keep their kids in schools, et cetera. This could also include family members if they're getting take-home rations it generally does not include teachers, cooks, uh, and school administrators who are receiving payments. The bottom right one here is measuring the cost of transport. So here, of course, this is a measure of cost. So lower is better. And what we find here is that uh, generally we're below targets for Rwanda and we're at or near the targets for Burkina, Burkina Faso. Uh, for Kenya, the results tend to be a little bit mixed. Uh, the next slide, we turn to indicators five through eight. So again, starting at the top left for indicator number five, this is for the cost of the commodities procured. So this is measured in US dollars. It does not include freight or shipping. Uh, what we find is that the um, costs were mixed in terms of uh, target versus actual. As we turn to number six, the quantity of commodities procured, these were generally at or near project targets, slightly above target for Burkina Faso in Kenya, and slightly below targets for Rwanda. Uh, th these quantities are being measured in metric tons, by the way. Um, We'll turn to number seven there in the bottom left. So this is the value of the annual sales. These are generally greater than targets with one exception uh, for R Rwanda and FY18. And then for indicator number eight, the volume of commodities sold, uh, they were generally at or near targets. Again, with that really obvious exception 
for Burkina Faso in FY 2021. Um, the comments in the indicator reports uh, said that this was just due to a much higher than expected uh, yields and production. Uh, here we are looking at indicators 9, 10, and 11. So the top left, number nine, here we're measuring the increase in installed storage capacity. Uh, initially below target in Burkina Faso, but then way more than made up for in FY21. And then for R Rwanda, we were at or near target. Um, number 10 is a measure of the policies, regulations, or other administrative procedures um, implemented during the program. What we see is that the, the results are kind of mixed in terms of whether they met uh, their targets or exceeded them. And then at the bottom, indicator number 11, uh, this is for the number of individuals receiving short-term training. So here we were slightly below target for Burkina Faso, but above targets for Kenya and Rwanda. We're getting to the end of the, the indicators, at least for fiscal year, so bear with me. Uh, here we're looking at 14, 15, and 16. So indicator 14 is measuring the number of public-private partnerships. Uh, these were below target for Burkina Faso in Kenya, but at or near targets in Rwanda. Uh, indicator 15 is measuring the value of new commitments or investments. These were greatly exceeding targets for Burkina Faso. That's in FY21, um, but generally below targets for Kenya and Rwanda. Um, and in fact, in, in several of those for Kenya and Rwanda, both the targets and the actuals were zero. Finally, for indicator number 16, the number of schools reached. Um, so here we have some challenges because we, we don't have uh, we only have uh, 20 and 21 to look at, 22 and 23 are obviously uh, to be determined, but generally we're seeing a slightly lower uh, than expected uh, in FY21 for Burkina Faso. So to summarize all of those figures I just dragged you through, well, we found that in terms of fiscal year performance, um, those targets are slightly more likely to be met or exceeded relative to target. So we find, uh, again, ignoring the cases where we don't have data or we've got zero targets, um, we find that 34, the actual exceeded or met the target. In 28 cases, uh, the target was, excuse me, the actual was below the target. Now again, keep that in mind that this is by fiscal year. What we'll turn to now is comparing, um, well, excuse me, in just a moment, what we'll do is, is we'll compare that over the life of the project and things look a little bit different. Before we get to that life of the project, we do have a few indicators that had non-zero uh, uh, target levels, excuse me, non-zero baselines. And for those, we can compare the baselines to the actual. And so remember that indicators 7, 8, and 12 are the only ones that have non-zero baselines. And keep in mind that none of our three countries use the number 12, so we're left to indicator 7 and 8. Um, also keep in mind that baseline data were missing for Rwanda. So given all of that, uh, all of those qualifications, what we see is that in all the cases, the baseline was eventually exceeded in subsequent years, uh, and implying an added value of the program. So again, this is for the values of annual sales for indicator number seven on the left, and then the volume of commodities sold for indicator number eight on the right. So again, eventually those baselines were greatly exceeded in several cases across all three. So now let's turn to the project life performance targets versus actual. Now, because we just went through all 14 of the indicators in, in great detail, I'm going to go a little bit faster here since we're familiar with them. And what we're looking for are the general, the general findings is whether 
the actual at least met the target or exceeded it. And what we're seeing is that uh, at least for indicator number one, we're seeing that actual met or exceeded the targets, greatly so in Kenya. This was the case also for indicator number two. Again, we either met the, the target as in Rwanda or greatly exceeded it as in the case of Kenya. Uh, for three, again, we see a, uh, a significant exceedance for Kenya and uh, some exceedance for Rwanda, but not as drastic as the case in Kenya. And now for number four, remember this is a measure of cost. So here, ideally, we'd like to be below the target. And indeed, uh, transport and storage and handling costs were indeed below target uh, for Kenya and Rwanda, where we had the, uh, the target metrics. Turn, turning to the next set of indicators, again, we find that the actual exceeded the target. Now, this is for cost, so in this case, uh, not exactly what we wanted, but it wasn't a, a drastic uh, difference when comparing target and actual. Uh, as we turn to indicator number six, uh, slightly above target for Kenya, slightly below target for R Rwanda. Uh, for number seven, uh, again, uh, nearly meeting the targets in both cases. And again, for Burkina Faso, even though we don't have target data, we do have that baseline data, and we see there that the, the baseline was greatly exceeded. And then similarly for indicator number eight, uh, the targets were exceeded, and for Burkina Faso, the baseline was exceeded. As we move to indicator number nine, uh, the target was, was met and slightly exceeded, so that's a good thing there. Uh, some mixed results for number 10, which is the number of policies implemented. Uh, for number 11, the number of individuals receiving short-term training, uh, greatly exceeding the target for Kenya and meeting the target in Rwanda. And then for our last set here for 14, 15, and 16, uh, the number of public-private partnerships uh, did not meet target by, by some uh, substantial amount, uh, but in Rwanda it was met. Uh, for indicator 15, we have less information here, um, but generally the target was, was not met for Kenya. And then finally for 16, again, only Burkina Faso used this indicator and we didn't have target information. So really, we can't make a comparison there. So to summarize the project life uh, indicator data, we see a, a much better story than what we saw from the fiscal year. So here what we see is that out of all the cases where we could make that direct comparison, the, the actual met or exceeded the target 17 times relative to only seven instances where the target was was not met. Um, so to summarize, across all of these standard indicators, we see that when looked at from the individual year perspective, uh, the targets met or exceeded, the targets were met or exceeded about half of the time, but over the life of the project. So as, as projects were able to overcome any kind of bumps in the road that they may have met, those targets were met or exceeded three quarters of the time. So much the projects were, were uh, definitely able to, to compensate for any initial uh, hangups to meet their targets moving forward. And, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And there are, there are a lot of questions, lot of questions that, I'm that I'm going to just um, read it at the end of the of the presentation. Uh, so now we are moving to. Um, oh, excuse me. Another part of the the presentation uh, and we're going to be looking at more broadly. Um, 
partnerships for school feeding. So we saw in both of our uh, presenters uh, very important successes from the implementation of the programs, both at the um, educational outcomes and also building local capacity for uh, provision of uh, school meals. So this third part uh, is um, broader uh, in the sense that it kind of like takes on both the LRP and the McGovern Dole program, but also is a reflection on what's, uh, what has happened and, and what's next. So we were, uh, we call it number one, because uh, it was our first uh, research question, but uh, we were tasked to address these uh, question of what kinds of partnerships with the private sector and or host country governments are the most effective at ensuring program sustainability. And from that, among uh, the successful partnerships, who are the key players and what are the roles? And in what context do private sector and or government partnerships work best? And in which context may be more challenging? To this later part of the question, we added um, the partnerships also with local communities and with uh, nonprofits um, organizations. So the method or the way to approach to this uh, issue of partnerships, uh, it's a qualitative research approach uh, where we begin by compiling and analyzing school feeding related national level policies, uh, as well as national socioeconomic context. It was followed by uh, what we call outcome mapping, where we conducted a systematic review of my governmental and LRP performance uh, review of uh, the data and the evaluation reports. Uh, follow also by an um, actor mapping of the McGovernor and NR LRP programs using a tool that we call the PAT, the Partnership Assessment Tool, conducted and analyzed semi-structure interviews with key informants from uh, implementing partners, and we finally prepare a case-by-case -case analysis where we included a section and institutional framework um, my Govern Dole and LRP programmatic features and outcomes, and finally the whole analysis of partnerships. We believe that those three aspects are um, critical in the analysis of partnerships. It is the moment to uh, thank my uh, students, uh, Sierra Nelson and Robert Colbilla. They were both uh, PhD students in, in sociology. And and they were like researchers in these in these effort along with other um, researchers at Mississippi State uh, Social Science Research Center. So why uh, we wanted to start by a shared understanding of of partnerships in our research. Uh, partnerships for school feeding are any relationship, whether permanent or temporary, between groups, organizations, or persons where there is collaboration and exchange of resources to achieve share or similar feeding related goals and to gain mutually beneficial outcomes. It can take a contractual form. Uh, either sub-grantees of uh, my governed uh, implementers might be partners because of their uh, uh, experience and capacity to improve sustainability of the efforts and um, ultimately uh, these different forms of um, of the partnerships ultimately contribute to the sustainability of the school fitting activities and therefore it takes me to the second part of this slide and is why partnerships matter um, Partnerships for school fitting support planning and implementation, and they also contribute to developing sustainability strategies. The underlying assumption under each McGovern Dole project is that school fitting activities would be handed off for leadership and management to local stakeholders, either the national governments, most of the times, with local support of local and regional authorities or local communities. And under the McGovern Dole programming efforts, partnerships with a variety of actors are critical to build organizational, technical, and financial capacity to ensure sustainable school fitting outcomes. So, Key message, thinking about sustainability. Uh, that's why partnerships are important. 
So we begin by, uh, as I mentioned earlier, conducting a policy uh, analysis, and this is a graphical depiction of the type of analysis we did. This is uh, for Rwanda, where we started at looking at the long term strategic level plans and this in, in the top blue level. Uh, how um, school feeding was uh, added to the strategic level policies followed by medium and short term strategic level plans where both in the strategic uh, national level and the med and medium and short term strategic levels there are um, international partners uh, like the UN, the African Union, the World Bank, the IMF, participating in the development and sometimes the support for the implementation of education related activities. Uh, later uh, at the gray box, we see more the sectoral efforts, usually that can be grouped into the educational level efforts uh, and usually school feeding activities fall under the educational uh, strategic uh, plans seeking to improve educational outcomes uh, um, at a global scale, but also they cross with other sectors such as health and nutrition, uh, trying to target food security um, goals and nutrition goals. And then uh, very importantly, and as it relates to our uh, procurement element, the involvement of the agricultural sector, it's important as this, uh, they needs becoming a multi-sectoral approach. In the bottom and uh, in terms of a timeline, uh, we saw that in the four countries of interest for this uh, question, there is uh, already uh, multi-sectoral uh, formal policies for a school feeding. So here, uh, the four cases that uh, we use for the public partnerships include Kenya, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. They are all centralized governments, non-federal. And um, it's important to notice that they all have already a national, a form of a national policy uh, in place. And uh, very importantly, the role of my governor has been critical in one way or another in the formation of these uh, policies. So here is one example, uh, the Kenya's homegrown school feeding program where the transfer to the national government has been completed. The first effort uh, was uh, on to the provision of school meals and other um, educational and nutrition and dietary practices uh, activities, but then more recently, the more recent awards given to uh, Kenya focus and capacity building for the uh, local implementation of the uh, program. So with that, this effort has had a very significant impact on uh, 1.6 million children benefiting from the program in over four um, thousand schools. So here is an example of a quote from our informants that uh, um, states that our collaboration has been very strong in the sense that every year we would do a partnership agreement with the government that outlined the responsibilities of the WFP and the responsibilities of the Ministry of Education. This strong collaboration was very useful in ensuring the transition in 2008 18 was successful. And this is just uh, one of multiple examples of how the presence of my governed all in country has contributed to the development of um, um, local programs and specifically national policies. So to summarize the achievements of uh, in the public partnerships area, uh, MGD or Magovandol implementers have engaged in the development of policy and regulatory frameworks and we see at the very beginning of the presentation how this was built in in the program uh, design. Uh, my governed all implementations also have helped to gain government commitments towards school feeding and uh, I think having a national policy is a very important example of gaining uh, government commitments towards school feeding. And um, we saw in, in all the cases that there are important efforts in which my governmental projects are working towards building uh, public capacity among uh, public sector officials for school feeding. I'm sorry. Uh, 
We also see there are uh, important learning opportunities in this effort when collaborating with public partners. Uh, the what we call or literature calls co-creation, meaning engaging the partners strongly from the very beginning, uh, from the early stages of implementation, it's uh, important, but we understand that it's not always possible. Um, the knowledge about resource mobilization uh, strategies, meaning how this is going to be funded, sometimes remains limited in the policy documents. And it's very important to continue working with governments to ensure that expectations about community contributions are realistic, because one of the, the countries uh, of interest uh, in the implementation stage of the policy, they highly rely on community contributions to uh, ensure um, that a school feeding is going to be provided, but sometimes we know that there are uh, local conditions of food insecurity uh, and risk that may prevent communities from really engaging in the um, provision of a school meals or, com or contributing to that. Critically, the um, partnerships with private sector are important, and as Dan was mentioning, uh, earlier in his uh, presentation, uh, in the case of Rwanda, we saw a very important efforts and collaborations between smallholder farmers uh, and buyers, and how really can lead to improve the capacity of uh, farmers. And even if the situation is not ideal here, we have seen very important progress uh, due to the presence of this, this collaboration. We saw in our research also that fortification is an important area of um, collaboration with the private sector, even if fortification is, uh, the regulation for fortification is still uh, centralized and uh, government uh, managed. Uh, there are important efforts that can be developed, especially in um, innovations. For instance, these uh, effort from Rwanda where the Rockefeller Foundation provided funds to carry out a pilot to take the usage of nutrition rich whole grain 45 flour among school age children to reduce the usage of highly refined flour in school meals in my governed old schools. So this is a really good example of how like having uh, no other um, nonprofit partners uh, and local uh, private sector with develop uh, innovations that can further improve um, school meals. And in Kenya, very similarly, a partnership with DSM supported access to sachets of mi micronutrient powders that helps to meet micronutrient needs of children, especially in the most insecure areas of the country. Uh, from the analysis of uh, partnerships with the private sector and connecting what we de what we saw on the uh, local procurement uh, part of this presentation, is that these LRP projects facilitated connection between farmers and and markets. Uh, that there is uh, a lot of room for innovation to ensure that the school meals uh, have nutrition nutritious components and then the private sector can be a key player and the LRP learnings um, continue forming government own um, programs. There is also room for uh, learning and um, there is a need to continue increasing awareness about the role of uh, private sector engagement in school feeding, maybe refine those frameworks and, and create like key messages to targeting uh, partners in the private sector. Uh, and that will further uh, um, these effort that the partners, the implementers are already doing in, in working with uh, uh, developing private sector public and private sector partnerships uh, and um, identify, continue exploring where throughout the value chain there are opportunities for engagement of the um, private sector. Uh, we also look at community uh, engagement and we call community partnerships and we so very, very important work in the case of uh, Tanzania and we identify four areas where communities are uh, currently engaging in school feeding. Those are accountability, empowerment, community contributions, and community production. So I think um, 
from our analysis, Tanzania has a very successful example of um, involvement of uh, communities uh, in in um, in strategic planning and oversight. They have very both uh, Tanzania and Sierra Leone have very important work with uh, we and uh, women empowerment and silk groups. Uh, engaging women and I know in the chat there was a question about women engagement and this would be a role where a place where there is a uh, women engagement besides uh, just girls in school. Uh, there is very important efforts and community contributions both in, in Tanzania and Sierra Leone and uh, from Teresa's presentation when we talk about dietary diversity this is an effort that would contribute to um, Community engagement would contribute to to ha have that uh, dietary diversity component and others. There are other very important efforts too in in Rwanda and Kenya programs led by the World Food Program, uh, where there is efforts to do train of trainer modules on school gardening, nutrition watch committees, PTA committees, and uh, like that. So with these community level partnerships, as I mentioned, there are four areas of community engagement, accountability, empowerment, community contributions, and community productions. And partners, implementing partners of McGovern Dole have um, done very important efforts to um, implement capacity, capacity building activity among uh, community members that ultimately will contribute to the sustainability of the programs after transition. Uh, as I mentioned when I was talking about the governments, again, it's important to make sure that the governments understand uh, that um, that communities can contribute, but they have to be realistic about the expectations of the contributions that they can um, give to the programs. And um, here is very important also to know that in many cases, women uh, because of the role, traditional role, and um, they are important in the school meal provision, but they cannot be uh, overwhelmed with the demands from them. Uh, something that has been very successful in Tanzania, for example, is how there is uh, how they account for community contributions. I think that having that accounting, uh, um, consistent and systematic accounting would really inform and give back to the communities about that, uh, what they are giving. Uh, finally, our analysis for the uh, partnerships with the nonprofit uh, sector, uh, they in many cases are McGoverned all sub grantees. Uh, but they are considering in our analysis is called feeding partners because of the relevance of their activity for program sustainability. So for instance, Gardens for Health International are doing um, trainings on school gardening. Uh, those are important examples of how they contribute to uh, community engagement and community um, capacity building that will later fit in the sustainable models of school feeding. Um, so therefore, because of their expert knowledge, they are um, can implement components like development and dissemination of literacy materials, gender sensitive programming efforts, wash activities, etc. And they have proven to play a critical role in community capacity building, which again, sorry to it, but important for the sustainability of the school feeding efforts. Uh, so achievements for these types of partnerships can be summarized as technical support in the implementation of both McGovernDOL and LRP, implementation of gender sensitive programming, and contributions to the program sustainability by using evidence-based evidence knowledge to develop local capacity in areas like education, health, and nutrition. And um, we know that in most cases, these relationships uh, are um, resource-based, and we understand that the lack of financial resources may hinder the possibility to maintain a long-term uh, engagement. So to summarize and close this section, uh, the analysis uh, of my governmental program activities revealed that in the latest phase of implementations, like the four that we looked at, 
there is a focus on local capacity building for ownership and administration of the school feeding uh, activities, and it increases at the end uh, of the program. While uh, the provision of a school meals slowly drops until MGD no longer provides commodities for a school meal or take home ration provisions. Um, however, the co-creation needs to start earlier in the implementation. Accountability needs to be at the top of the priorities during the transition time and post-development supported efforts. Communities need to continue playing a role in program monitoring and oversight. And um, as the LRP component has been added to the McGovernmental efforts, there is a need to align LRP work with policy uh, goals. Um, there is a need to continue efforts to develop um, return on investment statements from economic research that inform policy formation. So governments need to see the long term gains uh, benefits of a school feeding where the government is a direct beneficiary of a school feeding in terms like human capital development. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate that. And we uh, I think Brooke uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I didn't get to introduce myself earlier. I'm Brooke Jamison um, with the USDA, the Foreign Ag Service. We oversee the McGovern Dole program. This has been so informative. I appreciate um, all of your time so much. Uh, we couldn't do this stuff without you, and so we appreciate Mississippi State for taking a look, for making sure these programs are on track, for giving us good recommendations. I also want to uh, thank all the PVOs who actually, actually deliver these programs. Um, I know many of you are online and we appreciate you so much. This could not happen without you. Um, and so I just taught to the this year is the 20th anniversary of the McGovern Dole feeding program. And so we want to see it continue and grow. I think everybody agrees it's important. There are changes um, that in recommendations we are always open to taking, but we appreciate you. So I know there's a million questions in the chat and I do not want to cut any of those off. So I will keep it short and just a giant thank you to everyone on this call and you can go over to the questions now. Brooke, thank you so very much. Um, um, many thanks for, for joining us this morning. Um, we have quite an audience still, so let, let's jump into our Q&A and discussion session. Um, I know Sierra over at Mississippi State, she's been monitoring the chat. Do we want to take a look at the questions? Are there any lingering questions in the chat? And then we can move over to maybe folks unmuting themselves and asking questions or making comments. And uh, when you do that, there is a raise hand function and we'll do everything we can to recognize you. And when we do recognize you, please identify yourself and your organization. Thank you. Thanks, Aviola. Sure. Um, I'm going to start trying to go through the chat. Um, so we posted the for the for the section number one, we posted the um, the reviews that are uh, available online. They are uh, there. Um, Teresi, uh, there is a question from Arif. Uh, did you observe an increase in net enrollment or just the enrollment in treatment schools? You're muted. So which which country? Uh, there was increase in enrollment, but it's it was really not um, you know it was six percent uh, increase in in enrollment uh, in 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 treatment in in intervention schools in Tanzania. Yeah. Um. So so it's. It's not a, a huge increase, I will say, right? It's uh, it's a it's a slight increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of questions for for Dan. Um, I think what are the two biggest challenges and two biggest biggest successes of uh, the LRP program? and the impacts of LRP on the local economy. And I know there are challenges with data that maybe you want to talk to us, to us about that. Uh, yeah, this is Dan. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer the, well, I'll dodge the second question first. 
Um, we didn't have enough data to say anything about uh, what the impact was in the local economy, but I mean, the evidence that we do have indicates that there was a lot of positive, uh, a pos positive impacts. Um, in other words, there was there was more local foods uh, going to the schools. Uh, quality was improved for particular cases where, um, either through the co-ops or the smallholder farms, we saw improvements in quality and and delivery. So, my my guess is that there were positive impacts locally but I, we're not able to quantify them. Um, let's see, the second question was what, the two biggest challenges? Um, two biggest successes. Yeah, the two big successes. So, um, hmm, so let's see, I, I would say that the big challenges appear to, to be uh, transportation challenges and, and timeliness, so, so getting the facilities and the, the mechanisms in place to, to actually move the food to where it needs to be on time. So it, it seemed like the capacity was there, but then there was just a lot of little things that that got in the way to have the food delivered on time. So I would say the the quality and quantity control, and and again due to transportation, seemed to be the biggest issue. Um, the biggest successes, um, what I saw through, at least through the indicator data, was that generally targets were met. And to the extent that those indicators are capturing, you know, the key goals, I would say that um, that's a big success, right? The the programs were meeting the goals that they had set for themselves. Um, and it seems to be that these programs are definitely reaching students and having a positive impact in terms of uh, getting food to them and giving them uh, reasons to to go to school. So. Um, that that would be my answer to the two biggest challenges and, and the success. Thanks, Dan. And related to the targets, there is a question on how much the discrepancy between target and actual might be due to imperfect setting of targets rather than issues related to LRP performance or impact. I'm sure that had a uh, that had a had a role. I mean, we can't tell. All we have are the data. Um, but but I would imagine that several of these indicators could be interpreted differently or could just have been some challenges in, in measuring those things. So I'm sure that had a role. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, um, this is might be a question for um, Abiola Pitchin or anyone from uh, my governed all. Uh, someone is uh, curious of uh, why Tanzania was not included in the LRP evaluation. I'm going to pitch in and then Aviola, you can come and comment on this. Um, sure. We had an overwhelming amount of uh, effort of work, and it's not because the efforts in Tanzania are not important. They are very important, and we saw that the work with local communities was so important that we just prioritize our efforts and decided to go to look Tanzania for both question on nutrition and the question on partnerships. Uh, not not because it was less important than the other efforts. I don't know, Abiola, if you want to comment on that. No, no, exactly right. When we embarked on this two years ago, we had to make some pretty tough decisions as to which country we wanted to focus our efforts. And plus, with so much of things that we do, um, programming is dependent on funding. So we had to restrict, you know, our our reach and, and how we approach this. So that's one of the main reasons. In addition, just so that everyone knows, um, folks may not realize that this was a complete desk study. Granted, there were provisions um, for travel, but uh, as you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic um, <laughs> provided a lot of additional unnecessary color to the way we live our lives and the way we, we do our work, and uh, this being no exception. Good, thank you. Um... There is a question about uh, uh, Dan. You already responded that. Sorry. Um, a question about the the sustainability, and could you speak a bit more uh, about it? Um, sustainability is built into the um, strategic um, 
approach of the program and that is why there is beyond the provision of a school meals there are so many more activities embedded on the educational literacy component of the program as well as the uh, nutrition awareness and um, improvement of um, health and dietary practices but also just building in um, institutional uh, aspects just engaging communities engaging local governments uh, that seems to be a way that the program is just not coming to be implemented at one time uh, and gone but instead is just building something uh, in the um, uh, local communities and local governments that is just going to hopefully last but we understand that uh, that also comes with challenges and it's not like a, an effort that is just going to happen very quickly but instead there is a very important role that the implementers are playing in um, the development of relationships and partnerships with locals to really um, plant the seeds for for sustainability. I don't know if anyone at uh, McGovern Dole wants to comment on that. OK, uh, we have 15 more minutes. Um, maybe uh, there are a lot of other questions in the chat, but maybe if, if you want to open the floor for more questions, maybe for for Teresi that she was the very first one. Um, Maybe we can open the floor in this 15 minutes left. I think there is uh, one question. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to read it. Uh, the last question. Uh, if we think that there should be a nutrition outcome that McGovernor should measure as of now, the main goal is to improve literacy and education outcomes. Um, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, so we, um, we try to find ways how to measure the education outcomes and, uh, from our, uh, literature review of other, you know, uh, uh, research studies done, uh, it was not necessary always, uh, you know, literacy or or, or test um, achievements, but it was really more uh, attendance, length of stay, dropout rate. <laughs> uh, you know, so all those uh, were considered uh, educational outcomes. Basically, if the, if the kids uh, go to school, and um, for for the future i think yeah um the literacy definitely uh will be wonderful to have uh more data on 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 you know literacy and and test testing testing outcomes but i think the attendance is still uh very important more important than the enrollment uh as you know we saw from our um uh, uh literature review uh, because uh, sometimes, you know, children enroll, but they don't necessarily, you know, attend uh, the school. Um, so, so I think that that's very important. And the length of stay at school, that they, they really stay that uh, time at school. Yeah, so, so any kind of... Uh, literacy or test scores uh, were very scarce, I will say. We, we, we had more uh, data on attendance, enrollment, dropout rate, and, and things like that. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, Lindsay, I think you raised your hand. Thank you so much. Um, and I also want to extend my uh, gratitude for this wonderful presentation. Um, just wanted to touch base on that item as far as the main goal of McGovern Dole is improved literacy. I would say that is definitely a central goal, the improvement of um, primary education literacy. We are looking to support holistic school meal programs that encourage uh, school attendance, as, as Therese mentioned, um, 
Therese mentioned, uh, enrollment, participation, um, but also looking at the improved use of health and dietary practices. Um, it is long been an under-realized area of what is a an appropriate activity, uh, what is an appropriate indicator for measuring nutrition, improved nutrition of school-aged children in these environments that can be done at scale and it's certainly an area just of future research that we are definitely interested in following uh, from the McGovern Door program and I'm often asked how do we show how do we demonstrate on an outcome how uh, we're impacting food security and um, and improved nutrition of school aged children especially if it's a very important school meal in a day but um, how to how to measure that systematically so i'll just say that's definitely a very important question and just want to reframe we we definitely look at improved literacy educational outcomes as key we've been able to measure that for a good few years um better and better uh, the quality of our data improves nutrition it's definitely um the experts tell me a lot trickier to uh to measure in a school age children population. Um, thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, I think Derek, raise your hand. Hi, Derek. I know you have uh, been very active and has yes. given us very good, important points and questions. Yes, good, uh, good, uh, good morning. And uh, I just want to say uh, thank you all um, for this fantastic research and presentation. Um, but I did, uh, I did have a question about uh, the role of the international partners. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe this is kind of out of the realm of your, um, your research. Uh, and I was just wondering about the role of, you know, international partners uh, in terms of, um, Contributing to school feeding and and uh, an outcome, and I I just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts about what is the role of the international uh, partners in terms of uh, school feeding programs and an outcome, and also one final um, uh, question has to do with um, uh, the um, RLP and. One of my, uh, one of the things that I've always looked at is when the commodities are monetized and uh, what would be the, uh, the impact of that in the local economy. Um, um, from your presentation, I don't think I was able to capture the impact of when the commodities are monetized and what would be the impact of that in the local economy? So those are the things that I'm kind of looking at. So I wanted, you know, to kind of hear your thoughts of uh, hear your thoughts about those two uh, areas of interest. Thank you. Over. Thanks, Derek. Dan, do you want to take that last question first, and I'll take the first then. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So. Um, the simple answer is I don't think we know. Um, although we have evidence from the indicators that, uh, you know, for example, the the sales increased as a result of the program, we, we don't know exactly what that means in the in the larger economy outside of the of the program. So, for example, we don't know for sure if that means more is being produced and sold, or if it means that some commodities are, are simply being moved from one destination towards the schools and the program. I would hope it's it's the former, right? That more is being produced. Um, another thing to consider, and, and we don't know for this program, but there is some evidence in the data is that sometimes programs like this can have upward pressure on prices in local markets, which would mean that it's it might be a good thing for the producers and it might be a good thing for the program, but people that are the the regular people in the communities buying these same commodities might have bigger challenges, right? If they're facing uh, higher prices for the goods that they're buying. So 
you know, again, we we don't really know what that impact is. I'm hoping it's it's positive, and the the data we do have would would lend some some evidence to to that, you know, potentially being the case. But we don't know for sure. There's just there's 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 no good data, at least in the time frame that we had, to be able to to link the program to the local economic impacts. Thank you, Dan. And uh, regarding the question about the uh, role of international partners on school feeding, I think the presence of Mago Vandal is a really uh, significant example of how um, international donors uh, on one side, but also implementing partners have played a very critical role uh, in the um, provision of school meals, but also developing uh, activities uh, that are just beyond the provision of a school meals. And their interest on sustainability uh, is definitely important for that uh, post uh, um, project implementation. And I think both uh, our uh, nutrition component effort and uh, procurement effort have really shown that there are important outcomes from the effort of international partners uh, through the use of Mac uh funds and also in terms of like partnerships we know that the presence of these have really contributed to um, improve the landscape for school feeding programs one very significant uh, partner and player nowadays is the world food program and the world food program uh, with the homegrown school feeding model and on other uh, this is just an example have really uh, have an impact on the um, bringing the discussion uh, to the table about the importance of a school feeding uh, being an important component on the educational sector and having long term effects on the capital human capital development in the country. So the, the research we did uh, really provided a very uh, just some uh, information about the effects of that that role. Uh, Derek had also a question about gender, and I'm going to pass it to my colleague, uh, Robert Colbile. Uh, he he wants to just have some insights about the role, because I think that is another uh, effect of the presence of international partners, is, is their uh, increase of gender awareness and some um, issues in that. So Robert, to you. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Gina. Uh, regarding the, the current role of women uh, in transforming school feeding, I think that the data we have currently suggests that women are already shaping our school feeding. Uh, first, uh, women disproportionately uh, offer their time to cook. Women are also donating uh, resources to, to the program. What are where we, and these are generally women control resources that a school feeding is demanding from household. So the women already are donating these resources to the school feeding program. However, from uh, a business perspective, we can also integrate women uh, as suppliers uh, within the value chain of, of school feeding. This is very important because uh, one, uh, it can lead to sustainability of, of the program because women resources women make from providing uh, these services tend to be retained within their household and impact the general households both health and education so moving forward partners may want to uh, prioritize engaging women-owned businesses as part of the suppliers of school feeding commodities and, and services. Uh, I also want to touch a little bit on the role international organizations can play. As countries transition to a uh, homegrown school feeding program, uh, one of the biggest challenge is, is funding and countries are beginning to cost share. That is, communities are mandated to cover a cost of providing uh, the meals. And if you look at the school feeding policies, government come across as just playing a philanthropic role in providing school feeding program. Uh, they are not seen as beneficiaries, but we literally just suggest that there's a direct link between 
higher education and lifelong commitment uh, to taxes. Government are the direct beneficiaries of increased taxes. And it's important we begin to repeat school feeding program to government, not, not as a philanthropic duty, but as a profitable business. Children who successfully graduate from school and are in formal employment are committed to lifelong higher taxes to this government. They pay for the costs that were invested in their education and they still remain committed to paying taxes to finance future government projects. So the orientation is very important. How are we repitching or marketing school feeding to government? Is it just a philanthropic duty from government to its citizenry or does school feeding pay for itself? The policies currently do not suggest that that's the orientation of government. Maybe development organizations need to begin to have this conversation and we can enhance this by generating data that link the increasing access to education to direct taxes to government. That could reposition you know, their commitment to funding our school feeding. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, we have one minute left. Uh, Aviola, you want to close us? I want to respect people's time, and I know it's late in some places. Sure, thank you, and and thank you all for, for bearing with us. I know this was a, a very, very long morning, but I, I think in cases like this and these types of engagements, I always like to exit with more than which I entered, and that's definitely the case here um, with this project. Um, I just want to send special thanks, um, and I can't name names individually, I'm afraid. There's just way too many, but uh, my USDA colleagues, and my colleagues over at USAID. Um, none of this would have been possible without your help, your, your guidance, and your input. So much appreciated. Um, and with that, I think, are there any more before we close out? Are there any more comments, questions while we're all still here? OK, very good. I will take the, the questions if there are some left and try to respond to people uh, then and uh, Devon. Devon is the Social Science Research Center director and she joined us this morning and I saw earlier Dr. Scott Wheeler was also in the call. So thank you so much for the institutional support both at the SSRC but also the departments, other Mississippi State University departments, Department of uh, uh, Agricultural Economics, Food Science, Health Nutrition, food science, nutrition and health promotion uh, and other units on campus to all uh, our students. Uh, that is definitely been a collective effort and definitely Abiola, thank you so much and all your colleagues at FAS and at USA. Uh, uh, Devon, I don't know if you want to close us out. Thank Just you. <clears throat> Thank you everybody for coming and on behalf of MSU and the Social Science Research Center, we really appreciate this opportunity to learn together with you about the Dole McGovern, Pro McGovern Dole program. So have a great day. Yep. Thank you. And Gina, one last thing. Earlier mm -hmm. on in the chat, there was a question about the presentation being made available. Yes, we will make the presentation available to everyone as well as the, the final written reports. Mm -hmm. So, right? All right. Well, Thank you Thank all so you very all much. Very much. Have a good one. Yep. Take good care, everyone. Stay well. Thanks, Thank all you. three. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.